All right, so uh, we are fortunate again to have uh, Dr. Uh, Odom with us, Dr. Jody Dion Odom from UAB, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Uh, Dr. Odom, welcome back to Rick and Bubba. How are you today? I'm good. Good morning to you both. How are you doing? Well, you know, we're great. We're, we, we've still got a, a long way to go, but congratulations to you and, and the team there at UAB. Uh, I know that you can, you know, give us the everybody settle. Let me tell you the good and, and, and the unknown. But remdesivir, are we saying that right? Remdesivir. remdesivir. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Would, mm-hmm. it, would it really bother y'all to name it something <laughs> that we can all say? <laughs> I mean, I like Blue that Emu. That my choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the folks Blue at, Emu would be so easy yeah, to yeah, say. The yeah, folks yeah. at Blue Emu, see, yeah. I, I, we all can say that. <laughs> all right. Remdesivir. So tell us, tell us the good news about this. I mean, I saw that Dr. Fauci is thinking it may become the standard, y- the standard of treatment. Uh, mm-hmm. I did see some of the stuff, correct me where I'm wrong and affirm me where I'm right. Uh, it looks like it may be able to make symptoms less severe and cut down the time you're sick. That's right. That's right. So this is a medicine that was studied um, in a really well done study over a thousand people that was started in February. So it was put together very quickly to try to get answers for whether or not this medicine worked. Um, I think that the first thing to know about it, it was given to people who were pretty sick. So they were in the hospital They were requiring oxygen therapy. Some of them were on breathing machines. So it wasn't the healthy person walking around. It was someone who took on the tough cases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what was seen in this really large study that was, again, you know, done with really high quality was four days faster um, time to improvement for the people who got remdesivir compared to people who got placebo or a, a sugar sugar medicine. You got to feel bad for them. I hate to say that. You got to feel bad for them. Yeah. I appreciate them though. You know, saying I'm in, but you know, it's the yeah. But that's the way to do the study, right? The you have to. to see if a medicine yeah. works. You have to. Is, you do. But you know, doctor, if it was you us, have to do it that way. If it was us and you was doing the study in my bed, I would reach over and and you know with your glove on and take your hand and go, hey doc, don't don't yeah. waste two weeks of my time. Yeah. Here, okay? <laughs> give, give me the good stuff. I would say, look. <laughs> you know what? You know what? You are right because the patient and the doctor always wants the best option, but yeah. until the study's done, you don't know what that best option is. So they blind the doctor and they blind the patient. The nurses don't know if it's the drug or the placebo. Nobody knows to make sure that that's preserved where you're looking really at the outcome of the drug and not right. the sicker patients well, got doc, it or the pa- of, someone who asked more nicely got it, you know? Doc, no. if, if none of those people knew, who who knows who's getting it and who ain't? Mm-hmm. It's the, the statistician, the person who does the blinding or decides if you're in group A or group B. They're really the only one who knows. So no one who's taking care of the patient, no one who's preparing medicine. That's how the, the blinded drugs work. Well, okay. also, another point we can take away from this, and it sounds like you're confirming it, but and I've always thought this, placebo is a real thing. People, people it, It's amazing what the body can do sometimes if all of a sudden your mindset becomes that something's working for you. It really can have an effect. Absolutely. The, the placebo effect is very real. And in some studies, 20 to 30 percent of people will improve when they're given a placebo. Um, so, yeah, the, the power of the mind is, is, is real. All right. Wow. So once again, though, so these people were really sick. And what did we see in the study? So they got this medicine for up to 10 days. And we saw that people who got their remdesivir improved by day 11 compared to people who didn't get remdesivir who, who improved by day 15. And so what about symptoms? Faster improvement. Yeah, what about symptoms? Um, I saw something that said know, they were a little less severe with the people that had it, or is that is that not good reporting? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, part of the problem with this study is we're, we're talking about the data that was seen by uh, what's called a DSMB, the group of people who monitor the safety and the efficacy of the drug. So what they said is they had to stop this trial because of this improvement that was seen, but we haven't actually read the full study. Okay. So I can't give you all the details. It's not published yet. It will be hopefully soon. Um, but these group of uh, scientists and doctors looking at the data very carefully said there's a clear difference between group A and group B. We need to tell the world so we can start to use remdesivir more widely. Doctor, can you address a little bit the the controversy or what we're seeing, the numbers now on ventilators? Ventilator was the hot word for a few weeks. Now it has disappeared from uh, the news cycles completely. But we, mm-hmm. we do know that people that went on ventilators, it the, honestly, it was not a good success rate. Like 90% never recovered. But is there is there some... Uh, 
I guess adjustment in that theory now that you're using more uh, what they would call a BiPAP, which would be, I guess, in between a CPAP and a ventilator, and that's working better or not? Or where are we at on the breathing part of it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think any time you're looking at ventilators, you want to remember you're talking about the sickest of the sick. So the patients who really can't get enough oxygen with an oxygen mask, with a BiPAP, are going on to the ventilator. So those are going to be the people who have the highest mortality in any study. Um, The initial numbers of 90% from that JAMA study were changed. The calculations were actually incorrect because they didn't account for all the people who were still on the breathing machine in the ICU, Mm -hmm. and the corrected number is more like about 25%. Um, So breathing machines save people's lives. We know that if you can't get enough oxygen on your own, having this machine helps you breathe is one of the ways to to get you back to health. So I think that 90%, um, uh, again, it was corrected. It was was too high. So like with so many of these things, you got to have the right numbers. I mean, initial Uh numbers are not always correct. And Rick, you were you were brought yeah. up earlier. The CDC, we're trying to Help understand us. the numbers, but it looks like they're moving them around and reclassifying them. We're we're really confused yep. on some of. Will we be all be better off because of this being so new, and things lagging so far behind, and things happening at such a quick rate? Will we all be better off to just say, let's all calm down on numbers? Right, and I know we're number driven, and we all want to see numbers. But it seems like because this thing is not was was a novel virus and, and, and there's so much that's unknown about it, we're trying to figure it out. Should we all just calm down? I mean, just like the thing we just heard about the ventilators. I mean, there was a number that came out; it had to be corrected. It, this, right. The CDC over the weekend, the CDC numbers of deaths went down. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. Uh, the, well, here it is on their website. Well, that website's ten days behind. Uh, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. Should we all just? I mean, I don't know how to. How re- do we? How can do we, we get a real number? Yeah, yeah it's a totally. It's, a, it's an excellent question. I think what you're seeing is this tension between everybody in the world wanting to know what's going on and really hungry for data, and people trying to get things out as quickly as possible. And you want to do that without bypassing your your. Um, accuracy checks, right? You want to make sure that the states and the localities and the CDC and the world are not sharing data that's incorrect. Um, So that's some of the pressure that you're seeing. Sometimes if we get things out too quickly, you may have to come back and make a a correction because it wasn't right the first time. That said, CDC is a reputable agency. Our public health officials are working really hard to try to confirm COVID cases, confirm COVID deaths. So some of the changes you're seeing is a death may be called COVID but not yet confirmed. When it gets confirmed, that number changes. All of these have that fluidity to them. Um, When it's all said and done, the numbers are going to be firm, but we're still early enough on that um, the correction is a good thing, honestly. To me, it means the correction means people are still thinking about it and trying to make the data as accurate as possible. But being calm and taking a deep breath and knowing that some of the numbers can change, you're, that approach you're saying is not wrong either. Well, let me. Come, we're about to go to break. This is the last thing I'll ask you, then we'll break and come back. Yeah. So have the CD, CDC numbers been adjusted down to fewer deaths over the weekend or not? So I don't know that data. I, okay, I okay. myself, That's, I was yeah. on call on Saturday, so I, I didn't look at the CDC numbers. I've definitely heard people saying the CDC numbers are changing on their website from day to day, sometimes up, sometimes down, which does right. it's hard to explain the down. Yeah, well, the um, politics of it. Because you think after you're dead, uh, they, that's, right. you know, you go in that well, column, that should be it. Well, right? well I, and, and if you look on their website, the, it is a lower number than we're seeing reported, but... Mm. Then at the bottom in the footnote, somebody said it says, well, these are usually 10 days behind, that these numbers that are on their website may not be current. So there's there's a lot to unpack. But again, you said you can't answer that, and I'm, I'm not going to force you to answer a question that you just don't know. So we'll come back. More Rick and Bubba coming up with Dr. Odom right after this. Rick and Bubba, Rick and Bubba. So uh, we've uh, we've discussed remdesivir and, uh, and that it is showing some promise. Uh, that was researched and tested there at UAB. So, uh, congratulations and well done to the team as uh, as they continue to research. Um, Dr. Odom, talk a little bit about we have states that are relaxing the stay at homes. So, you know, it, it varies wildly across our country, and a lot of it has to do with you know some states are it seem to have a much tougher time based on population and all this than others. So there's some common sense to it, but. Um, Tell us about as we're going back in and easing back into, um, you know, out of the stay at home. We're not to the point where everybody can just run out there and 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 go back to the to where we were. Like I, I saw some pictures 
from a trade day over the weekend. I don't know if they were <laughs> accurate pictures or not, but um, social distancing and masks didn't appear to be seen anywhere. But um, what, what would you like to tell society from a medical and science standpoint uh, how we ease back into this? Yeah, no, I think you said it well. I think the point is is that we are still sort of on this first curve. We went over the hump, but we're still on the way down or flattening. So there's still uh, two to 300 new cases a day here in Alabama and about 30,000 new cases a day across the U.S., with every county almost in the U.S. having cases. So it's, it's, some places are hit more hard than others for sure, but everywhere is impacted. So it's just a public health reminder that if you're going to go out to keep the, the separation, the six feet, to try not to be around anyone who's sick. This is not gone yet. It's still out there. Dr. Uh, Dr. Jody, what, what about the antibody test and those people who are carrying the antibodies? Uh, do we know any more about how effective a defense that will be or how long has there been? Is any of the data coming back on that yet? Um. So we still are, are just starting to roll out more of these antibody tests like we talked about before, that sign that you, this virus has passed through and that you're protected. We don't know yet if it means you can't be reinfected. There were some cases from Asia where people appear to get reinfected, and that's sort of been debunked. It looks like their virus that came back was a false positive test and was not actually a reinfection. Um, so a lot of people looking at this carefully to understand whether or not reinfection can happen. Everyone's hoping that you cannot be reinfected, at least within, mm-hmm. you know, the six to 12 months time frame. But stay tuned. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> and huh. and uh, there's a lot of concern about the fall when we move mm-hmm. back into what is normally our cold and flu season. Uh, second yeah. wave possibilities. What's, what's the thought? Yeah, so, I mean, remember, flu usually happens later in the year. So flu, although it, we vaccinate people in September and October, the most of the cases usually happen January, February, March. Um, so I think what we're talking about for this second wave is more August, September, people going back to school. But I think it's sort of a misnomer to call it a second wave at the moment because we're still on the plateau from the first wave. So the second wave would imply that we get all the way back down to zero, and we're nowhere close to that yet. What what about the research that we're seeing involving children? Uh, you know, there's there's been some countries and places saying that it's starting to show that children can't pass it. Now they certainly can get it, but that they there's some indication that they cannot pass it on to others or to other to adults. Is it what what's the latest on that? Do you know much about those studies? Yeah, so this is a really hot area. Everybody wants to know what to do with the schools and what right. how to understand kids. We think about kids as vectors, to be honest, of infection. They usually have runny noses, and they're the ones who get adult sick in the community. Um, But you're right. What there was is there was one study that showed that in a community, there was a very small number of cases in the adults that actually came from kids, and anyone younger than 18 were rarely the source. Um, I don't think that answers the question definitively because communities are different. Some of those adults may not have had any contact with kids at all, for example. Um, But There are some interesting things with what the level, the viral levels are in children being lower. It may be that this virus is different than other viruses that we're used to looking at. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be more definitive. No, but but you're saying, yes, there there seems to be some indication that this particular virus, that the the younger children, and I I think they were saying the ones that they they were really talking about elementary school, uh, that they were, and, and younger, that they were seeing a very low infection rate of them been able to pass it on to anyone, but they, they can't say that it can't happen. It just seems like it rarely happened. Is that a, is that a safe way to say Yeah, it? right. I mean, it's, 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 if we're talking about the same study, the one that I read was pretty well done, and it showed that most of the cases of coronavirus in patients who were diagnosed were coming from people who were in their 40s and their 50s. So when they broke it down by age group, they found very, very few infections from from people less than age 18. So that's where that headline came from. And, and Dr. Jody, we're, we're almost to the bottom of the hour, and I, I wanted to ask you this too because we, we trust your input on this and you're on the front line. Uh, and uh, apparently there's just studies galore right now on every, yeah, everything. Yeah, and we don't would, know what's good and what's bad. You would think so. But there's yeah. one study out there that says that this thing is going to run its course uh, in, a, in an area it takes about 70 to 80 days. And it really doesn't matter what you do. The results uh, are, are pretty much the same if you lock everybody down or you let them stay out. But it just takes about 70 to 80 days to run its course. Have you, have you seen that one? 
Yeah, so what you're talking about is basically the herd immunity concept, the idea that we have this incredibly infectious virus. Each person on average will infect two to three others if you don't have any measures in place. And if you just let it run through the community, at the end of that time period, you'll have herd immunity in the group. And that's true theoretically, but imagine all the things we have to get through to get to that point. That's a whole lot of death and suffering and disease that we do have some tools to prevent with physical distancing with some of the things that we're doing now. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to all, um, you know, get everybody infected to get to the other end of herd immunity. That's that's the hard path. In my yeah, and, I, and I'm running out of time, but I think also, you know, with the other patient, the economy and people's livelihood, sure, mm-hmm. I, I think certainly we can find a, an area we can be in both of those camps where we certainly get, get as much of the economy going as we possibly can while still practicing you know, the mask, the gloves, the social distancing, right. and, and maybe exactly. maybe there's a way to get exactly. both things happening at the same time. And certainly there's, there isn't a no-risk scenario. It just doesn't exist. We're, we're trying right, to... Right, but I think what you're saying is true. It's not just two paths, right? It's not right. the black or the white path. It's, right. we got to find a way to do it safely. I right. agree with that. Yeah, because the, there's a lot of desperation going on with people with livelihood and businesses and 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 we're not right. just we're not just talking about the economy. Yeah. I know people say, "Well, the wall yeah. is this is the rich." No, there yeah. there's people out there that certainly aren't wealthy. They don't have a job right now. And no, uh, and the unemployment rates are higher than they've been in a very long time, and it's it's a, it's a huge problem. You're, you're you're right. Thanks for your work, and thanks Thank for you, taking Dr. Jody t- taking time with us. Um, My know. pleasure. I'm glad to answer your questions. Yeah, well, you've done another great job. Thanks and, for what you do. And you're remember, doing. if Rick and Bubba end up in a blind study, we want the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that. I'll remember that. <laughs> I don't know. Rick and Bubba.